I am uh, David Scare at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, and we'll be looking at the gospel appointed for Christmas Day, and I will be reading it according to the Revised Standard Version. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to him be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in that region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will come to all the people. For to you was born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among, peace among when, men with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the same, which had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them, that Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds uh, returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, we are dealing with an entirely different Christmas account than what we are dealing in Matthew. In the previous presentation, I, I tried to present that uh, the account in Matthew, in uh, chapter 1 is not really the account of the birth of Jesus. It is more properly uh, called or entitled the conception of Jesus. And then in Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 he simply says uh, the evangelist says that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And he leaves it. The uh, coming of the wise men uh, does not belong to the account of the birth of Jesus. It's something which happens at a later time. Luke is the one who presents the account of the birth of Jesus. Now, I want to make a few comments concerning the order of the Gospels. Uh, it is typical among scholars to look upon Mark as the first Gospel. It is, it, it, that is the accepted and common orthodoxy. And uh, when uh, Lutheran scholars who don't want to, will simply avoid the question of asking or the question of which gospel is first. Um, I don't see in any way that Mark could be the first gospel because if Jesus had become, had become the center of the worship of the Christian church, um, it would, they, they, it would, from the very beginning, they would have to have had some kind of account of where this man came from. Um, Matthew is the uh, appears to me to be the first gospel, and his purpose is showing that Jesus is the conclusion of of all of the Old Testament, not just the prophecies but the entire Old Testament. That's the issue he addresses. It is Luke that really gives us the Christmas account, and um, this has to. Uh, if there is any section of the uh, of the New Testament that the people are going to know it'll be Luke chapter 2. Be uh, we do live in a time where Christianity is being squeezed out of the public square. 
but uh, somehow this passage here is going, uh, this section is going to find its way into the public domain, at least the section, and, and on earth, peace, goodwill to men. Uh, that'll be familiar to them. Um, I believe, at least I believe that this should, this account, this account more than any other account should be read with the highest deg uh, degree of solemnity as possible. And if it's and if it's, and if it is if it is possible, I think it could should be read in the King James version. Uh, the King James verses does have a majestic solemnity, which really fits the account. And and uh, and this is it's simply not just another. We're not just reading a, a Bi some Bible passages, or we're not just reading one story among other stories which are found in the Bible, but we are reading the account of how the Savior of the world has come to us. And uh, for many people, and this might be the only time in the year in the ch they're in the church, so it has to be read carefully. We cannot let uh, be, have this read uh, in an unprepared way. Now, in regard to the account that, um, and this was mentioned in the explanation for the Gospel of Matthew, and that the attention in Matthew is all on the person of Joseph. And now in uh, Luke, the attention is switched from Joseph uh, to Mary. Um, and you, this, can, this is understandable. If Luke is in any way aware of the Gospel of Matthew, and I think he is, he may recognize that there is a deficit or something incomplete in the Gospel of Matthew because the real miracle is on the mother of Jesus, uh, on, on, the virginity, on the virginity of, of Jesus. In Matthew, in Matthew, it, the problem is no, Jesus, Mary is not guilty of a, an adultery. Um, this, is the virgin's, this is the virgin's child, but without bringing her into the picture. Uh, here, by the way, it's on, it's on Mary's experiences. Now, uh, we always have, we, we should ask, where did the story come from? And um, uh, that answer, the answer to that question is found in uh, verse 19. Mary kept all of these things, pondering them in, Mary kept all these words, uh, uh, when it says uh, symbolo, pondering them, I don't think that's strong enough in the English language. Um, she becomes, she is, a, she is a true believer. It doesn't mean that she understood all these things. Nobody ever does when miraculous and more calamitous things happen. But she kept them in her, in her she kept th going in her mind. These thoughts kept going around and around and around. Uh, placing one thought over against uh, against another, and uh, I'm thinking of the Old Testament. Thy word have I kept in my have I kept in my heart. She recognizes that all of these events and what has been spoken are, is the word of God, and somewhere in these words is the salvation of the world. Um, I don't think we can, uh, yeah, you could, yes, it should be, it should be, yes, it should be emphasized that certain things about, certain things we just have to repeat again and again and again. And um, this story, it's not as if you heard uh, Luke chapter 2 read once, that you heard it read enough. Every time you hear it read, you are hearing it for the first time. And it kind of indicates how Luke came across this material and um, how did he get the material? Uh, yes, he was a scholar, uh, probably the uh, most significant scholar, uh, uh, an historical scholar. I mean, the true theological scholar was St. Paul, but he was an historian, a historical scholar, kind of indicates that he spent a lot of time with Mary and uh, when she related the, uh, the, the events of how she gave birth to Jesus and the circumstances that accompanied them, that she did not necessarily 
given in an outline form, one, two, three, A, B, C, D? No, this was something which he continued to think about even after uh, the ascension of Jesus into heaven. She realized her, she realized her place in salvation. She had a self-awareness of what God had, had done to her. Now, we mentioned in the last case, and we mentioned in, in regard to the Gospel of Matthew, the emphasis is on is that Mary is not guilty of adultery. Uh, that's prepared by the, uh, for, for that thought is prepared in the genealogy and then picked up by Joseph who wants to divorce Mary. Here the emphasis is entirely different and that is uh, in the account of uh, uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth and the promise that they would have a child, the attention is not so much on Zachariah. He receives the angelic, he re he re receives the angelic uh, visit that his wife is going to have a child but she being of an ancient age, the attention is not on him as the father, but Elizabeth at becoming, at a very old age, becoming a mother. And it's, this is the, that story is a replication of the account of Abraham, Abraham and Sarah. The, the Old Testament account, the Old Testament book of Genesis really is the story book of Genesis is really the story of Abraham and how he eventually conceives a child by his old wife Elizabeth and uh, then how that child is to be sacrificed and then the child's life is saved by coming by the angel coming and providing a ram all that type of Old Testament data is included in this particular story. Remember the attention is on the mother. That is where the miracle takes place. And there's certain, uh, uh, there's certain remnants of the Genesis story that God himself is preparing the child. Now what is striking about this particular pericope, uh, by the way I'm amazed that this account has been chosen for Christmas morning simply because it, it may be that what that it may be that one morning during the church year in which uh, the congregation uh, will not be at their alert best and uh, this deserves a lot of, a lot of attention but what is striking about this account is that it begins with a reference to the emperor and concludes with the account of the shepherds uh, this is absolutely striking because for this reason the emperor in the Roman society and that lasted for hundreds of years at least from the time of uh, Caesar Augustus up to the time of Constantine a period of over th about 320 years or so the emperor was revered as God. In some cases, he was revered on God, as God before, before he died. In other cases, he's revered as God after his death. I would place the writing of the Gospel of Luke before the fall of Jerusalem. I would place it, I would place, replace it in the 60s. At that time already, uh, uh, Herod, uh, Herod the Great had already built a temple in honor of Caesar Augustus in Caesarea, a port city on the Mediterranean. Um, the, the, the name of Caesar Augustus would, would have been all, would, was already known. And so it begins out really, <laughs> begins out with a reference to a man um, Who's, who was living in Rome. Caesar, it, in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. And someone's going to mention, uh, well, this is really not a taxation. Well, that, that really is a non-problem because the purpose 
of such a, it's a census. The purpose of all census, and we know that today, the purpose of a census is to determine how many representatives a given state can have. The purpose of the census, by, uh, the purpose of the census in, in any place in the, in the empire, was to find out how many people there were in each place. It's like preparing a budget for the church for, for the coming year. Uh, the congregational leaders have to know how many members they have, and uh, in order to meet their expenditures. Uh, so this is. But Caesar Augustus does not appear here as an unfavorable figure. Herod appears as a tormentor in the Matthew story. He is the one who waters the sl sl uh, slaughter of the holy innocent children. Here, by, here Caesar Augustus enters uh, the biblical history as a benefactor of the church because he, he issues a degree by which God's purposes of the fulfillment that the Christ child would be born in Bethlehem is going to be fulfilled. It's almost the same like Cyrus. It's, uh, maybe this is not the sermon to place. To, well, yes, I guess it is. It would be the place. You can't go into a long detail on this. But among all the um, inequities of life, the disappointments of life, the tragedies, the uh, inadequacies uh, adequacies we see in the government, and we all recognize that. Somehow God is working through that in order to bring about his plan of salvation. So see, it's almost like Cyrus in the Old Testament who gives the decree that the Jews in Babylon can go back to their homeland. And then it becomes, here the translations in, in, uh, to, uh, don't really get it. It says, this decree was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. It doesn't say he was governor of Syria. It's a participle. You recognize that. Hegemenon untus. He was governing Syria. And he was, he was a military figure, very much like General MacArthur, who was never given an official title. But he was the viceroy, the emperor over the Pacific, and um, that, that's and, and, and that's what, what he should be known for. Each should be going to his own city. Um, here we can combine the accounts of Matthew and Luke, on so far as the Christmas account. I think it's um, I think the evidence points to that Mary and Joseph, after their marriage, intended to make their uh, home in Bethlehem because he's not just going there to be counted. He's going back to his patriarchal home, his, auntie, his familiar home, his own house in Bethlehem. And so it says, then jo Joseph went into uh, the city of David because he was of the house and lineage of David. And... Um, this corresponds to what Matthew has to say. Matthew, uh, Matthew puts down the specific details of how Jesus is per, point by point descended from David. Here, Joseph is simply said to be of the house of David, and this is to indicate the royal nature of, of Jesus. And this is presented in a very... Um, well, the purpose of the writing of both Luke and... Uh, Acts is to show that Christianity, the, the religion of Jesus, is not in opposition to the emperor, that they can both live side by side. It's not the purpose of, of, of Christianity to displace the, the, Ro the Roman emperor. And so it's, uh, and that, that's the way it goes. I mean, uh, uh, various kings show, uh, show hospitality to one another. When Alexander the Great uh, conquered the, uh, when he learned that the king of Persia had co committed suicide, went into mourning, even though he was his enemy. So here Jesus is presented almost as a colleague type of, of ruler. And um, 
Now you have the account of the birth. Um, Joseph goes with, uh, with Mary, and it happened while they were there. Her days came, to, and she bore a son, a firstborn son. Uh, th this does not preclude the possibility that there were later other children, uh, because there was no room for them in the end. Now, I don't know if you want to get into the story here, by the way, but the word for it. This is not, the, if you look at the, the word uh, in verse 17, fatne, um, uh, because I'm going to just read it here in English, in 2.7, laid them in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The, uh, the, the word, the last word in verse 7, katalimati, this was a room that was uh, reserved in the familiar home for a newly wed couple. Uh, they had extended families in the Old Testament living all under one roof. This is the family of Joseph, and this was the chamber reserved for the young married couple. The, um, they were apparently to go through the, it wasn't large enough to have the people, the women in the room to help with the assist on the birth of the child. This is not a manger. I mean, it's not a, it's not an inn. Inns really did not, inns, like, there were no ancient motels in the ancient world. Not the way we understand it. Um, they were, this, the birth happened in the house of Joseph, belong, uh, belonging to him. So they went down into the center of the home at the bottom floor, and they have this in places in Austria and Germany. The animals are kept in the center of the household so that the heat generated by the animals would be put to good use. Um, this is the way it happens in the Alps in those areas. And uh, if in, in, in New England, what they did is they connect, the, they didn't go down, the, the animals weren't kept under the house, but they were kept alongside of the house and all the, you'll see the houses, att the buildings attached to one another so that there would be heat to be generated it would be in that situation. Now, what is striking is how the evangelist goes from the very top of, of, the, of, of, the, of the society, the emperor, uh, Caesar Augustus, and, and his lieutenant, Cyrenius, who was the governor of, of Syria. He goes down to shepherds. Uh, that is, uh, 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 Luke is a literary genius on this particular point. Who is ever reading this gospel for the first time is fully aware of the person of Caesar Augustus. We already mentioned that Herod, Herod was appointed by Caesar Augustus. Uh, Caesarea Philippi is a town. They are totally aware of the Roman Empire and the Roman system and who was in charge. He goes down to the very dregs of society. The shepherds, shepherds in the ancient world, you could not become much lower than a shepherd. Um, and it fits in, and maybe this is the whole uh, Christmas they say is for children. Um, I think that's pretty good. I think that's right. I don't think Christmas is for the theologians. It's, it's for the children, those people whom the rest of the world does not care about, the shepherds. Um, it's, uh, if, you've, uh, if you've traveled in those countries where there are, where they still graze sheep and you see the shepherds standing outside with 20, 30, 40, 50 sheep, it doesn't look like the most pleasant job in the world. And uh, the, this is going to anticipate the crucifixion of Jesus in which a person who was worse than a shepherd, the thief, the thief who was, uh, the thief who was crucified with Jesus is the one who was promised by Jesus a place 
in his kingdom today uh, before the day is over remember Lord when you come into your kingdom today you will be with me in paradise and this is of course what we have here in the Christmas story is a touch of paradise with the account of with the account of the angels now some time ago I heard a lecture by the late professor Carl Doc, uh, professor Dr. Dr. Carl uh, Rengsdorf Carl Heinrich Rengsdorf and he made the point that um, this account of the shepherds, the angel coming to the shepherds, seemed to parallel the account of Romulus and Remus and the founding of Rome, these two abandoned children being suckled by wolves. And um, why at this, t why would you here bring in the account of men? Uh, taking care of sheep. It's an animal story. What's the purpose? Was the purpose, as he suggested, to remind the people of the story of how Rome was founded? Rome was founded almost in the fields, in a pastoral, in a pastoral situation, to indicate here that God was establishing a new a new kingdom, a kingdom that eventually would even surpass the majesty of the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus, a kingdom that would last and is still lasting centuries longer than the Roman Empire was. And there's a type of, um, yet yeah, always a puzzle, isn't it? You have here this is, this is really the Christmas story which is not contained in Matthew, in Mark, or in John. This is really a Christmas story. It's a story. And without this particular story, we wouldn't be able to celebrate Christmas the way we do. And we wouldn't be able to have Christmas cards. This is the, this is the account that gives us Christmas carols. This is the account that colors or determines how the Christmas service is going to be conducted with the reading of the scripture, with the singing of the carols. Um, yes, this could be, and I think it is, an exposition of the words of Jesus. Blessed are the, blessed are the poor in spirit, or as Luke changes it or renders it, blessed are the poor. Nothing could be poorer than shepherds. They had absolutely nothing. Yet to the poorest of all people comes the message that unto them is born in the city of David. Now, in, in Matthew, and you have to compare these accounts. In Matthew, the child is simply called Jesus, nothing else. He is absolute God. Uh, there's a reference to the Holy Spirit. There's no there was no uh, there's no uh, reference or allusion to uh, to the to God the Father in the Matthew account. This account is slightly uh, different. Um, it's here. It is glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will to men. Jesus here is described in imperial terms. It's almost as if uh, the the emperor comes in, uh, comes into his court, and the people shout, you know, glory to the to the emperor, and so forth. And because of the and if you look at the inscriptions in the ancient world, wherever the authority of the emperor was, the emperor was peace. The em the emperor, the emperor's political uh, message to the people. He had the power. And he would grant the peace. And here are these famous words, the well-known words, which even non-Christians use. And on earth, peace of good men, of good will. Um, um, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, how are you going to recognize this child? Uh, the child will be wrapped in baby clothes, and he will be 
line at the end of verse 12, you see the word in the fatni. He'll be lying in the place where the animals are, where the animals are feeding. Now that certainly um, re-emphasizes, no, so there are animals in the, where, in the, where Jesus is born, and there are animals where the, where the shepherds are. It's been conjectured, and, and I think it's very uh, an attractive option. It's been conjectured that the birth of Jesus took place sometime in the spring uh, when the ewes give birth to, to the lambs and that the shepherds were outside um, in order to help in, uh, bring these births to, to completion. It says, after the angels have sung the song, they, they return into heaven. It's almost, you know, this kind of an account if you have, you've been into, you've been into the, the European churches, the Catholic churches are a little bit more elaborate, especially the Baroque churches. Um, you walk into those churches and up there on the high ceiling or in the altar, they actually paint, they paint heavens with angels. Well, the angels might not be as chubby as they're shown in those pictures, but I think they got a point there. Here, Matthew, uh, Luke is presenting the total grandeur of heaven, of heaven and earth coming, uh, uh, coming together. And the shepherds, now the shepherds are presented as the ones who can put two and two together. They said, let's go to Bethlehem and see the word which the Lord has made known to us. That's absolutely beautiful. They interpret the, the, the words of the angel uh, as, as the word of God itself, and they are among the believers. It says they immediately went, you, they, they, they went, uh, they, they hurried, and there they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the, in the barn in the barn, and um, I don't know if on this particular, on Christmas you can't be, by the way, this is not a law of gospels. This is not, this is not the kind of pericope that can be used for a law of gospel sermon. I don't know, see how that, how that can be done. Uh, what's striking here though, is that they leave everything behind. They have only one thing in their, they have only one thing in their mind. If this child is in some way associated with salvation, they are going to be the first ones to get there. And there will be a lot of people who will be celebrating Christmas for all kinds of, all kinds of reasons. Some of them, I mean, probably most of them, have you no. Know, it's a time for the family to get together. It's a time to share gifts. It's a time to open gifts. It's a time to go buy gifts the day after. And all, you can get your, get your a time for big dinners a work and it says right here they had only one things on their mind they were obsessed with what what had happened to them and uh, they went and they found and then the next thing which they did of course we have a problem don't we in the Lutheran Church Missouri Center in fact all Christian churches do um, of, of churches, every our churches are not growing. Of course, the reason is we're not having children. That's the answer. As long as we don't have children, we're gonna we're, go, we're gonna have a declining church population. It's gonna be an aging population. But they were so enthusiastic. It says here in verse 17 that they they made that they spoke to the people. And the people them and all who heard that the, them, who heard them, they were amazed concerning what the shepherds had said. You know, it's a great. It's a lot of a lot of mothers have to work uh, simply to support the family, and there are all kinds of reasons for that. Life maintaining a certain lifestyle, not having enough money, being a single. 
but you lose something when you don't see the children growing up, especially from the time they're born to three years of age. Then they go to kindergarten. And they come home and they tell you all kinds of great stuff. The children want to talk about what happened to them. These shepherds are like children. They had no script. They didn't work. They weren't giving out pamphlets. It was, it, this, was, this was something that was so marvelous they had to share with other people. They were like kids who, couldn't, who didn't have enough time to tell you everything that was happening. And then now in verse 19, as already indicated, we know how the Gospel of Luke came into existence. And, uh, you know, as we get older, we repeat the same stories, maybe because we don't have any new stories, but we repeat the same stories without being aware that we're repeating the same stories. When these events, ha when these things happen, Mary is the major source. <laughs> you should say the only source. The only source of the Christmas account. So it wasn't as if this all happened at one time to her and then she just uh, wrote it down or told it once. This is something that she recalled again and again. I don't know about you, but if I'm trying to recall a past event, I write it down, and then as I read it, other things come to my mind and I even recall it more. And this is the way it was with Mary. Because she, she, she was not only the participant in the story, the participant, that is really a minimalistic statement with a participant, it was all about her. She was the one who got pregnant. She was the one whose, whose cousin gave birth to John the Baptist. She is the one who traveled down from Nazareth to Bethlehem. She was the one who went through the pangs of birth. And it was it to be a serious birth. You know, there was a, it, it's, it's quite common in Lutheran theology that uh, in giving birth, there was no rupture in her body. I just can't believe that because giving birth is an agonizing occasion. This, this was her life, her entire life. And uh, so she, she, she told the story again and again. Um, just, how a per just how the preacher or the pastor is going to go with the Christmas story. He can preach on this story. He can preach on this account in Luke chapter 2 for as long as he is a pastor. And every time he does it, he's going to see something that he didn't see before. And that's the way with the Word of God. And that is our eyes are continually opened. I wish you all the best blessings for this particular holiday. Thank you.